Again, welcome and welcome back uh, if you're new to the sessions. Um, hey, I'm so excited about today's session. So by way of preview, this is our last session of the year. We're going to pause these. We've got a lot of great feedback from a bunch of you, and we're going to incorporate that and, and plan to bring them back in the new year. But in the meantime, this is our, our last and, and most exciting session yet. We get to hear from Jean V, the co-founder and CEO of Hue, um, in what was named the Career Pivot of the Year <laughs> um, by Entreprenista. She took the, she was a PM at Google and she took the leap, planning to go found a company, um, went, got her MBA at Harvard with that as a as her as her plan and did just that. Um, and she's here to tell us about her story and the founding of Hue. So Jean V, over to you. Thank you. It's so great to be here. And I was just saying, I love this, love, love this initiative. And it's um, always awesome to connect with other um, Googlers and former Googlers. It, it really feels like such a great community. And um, yeah, excited to share a little bit more and like hopefully help and answer any questions that folks are having, especially as they consider a career pivot, or if you've ever thought about starting a company and kind of, that's a big leap from Google. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, more as well. Um, but maybe I can start by just giving a little bit of background. So um, I started my career at Google actually right out of undergrad. So I that was my first job um, and only like full-time job, um, corporate job um, after school. So I started as part of the APM program, which some of you guys might be familiar with. It's the Associate Product Management um, Program. Um, and I was at Google for about five years before um, leaving and going to business school and then starting my company. Um, while I was at Google, I spent about the first year working on search. Um, and then I moved to the Google Photos team where I was for about four years. So um, I joined Google Photos in about 2016. So it was a year after it had launched market within the broader, you know, Google ecosystem, it was like a smaller organization, which now is like really funny to think about because it was about 300 people, which is small <laughs> within within the Google um, mothership. And, um, but I had a really amazing experience there. Um, David Lieb, who's my boss um, at Google, he um, had a startup called Bump that exited to Google. And so he came from that like startup founder mindset. And I got to like learn a lot from him about how he operated as a product leader um, so spent about four years working on Google Photos. Um, when I left, it was at about, it was at a billion, had crossed a billion monthly active. So it was an amazing journey to kind of see that um, all the way through. Um, but yeah, my personal um, passion, uh, my dad's an entrepreneur. And so I always thought that like I wanted to start my own business one day. And I feel like I learned so much at Google that helped me understand kind of how to work with a cross-functional team of engineers, designers, you know, business people, like how to bring a product to life. And I felt like I was ready to take that leap to start my own thing. I mean, I really wanted to work on a problem that I personally faced as a consumer. So when I started to think about like what I cared about and you know what did I see as problems in my own personal life, I constantly was coming back to the shopping experience and specifically for beauty products. And just as a woman of color, like how difficult it was for me to figure out what products would work um, for myself. And as I talked to my friends, like Trisha, um, it was pretty clear that like everyone I talked to um, who shops for beauty had a very similar story and problem. I see a lot of ladies nodding here. And um, it felt like technology hadn't really been applied yet within the beauty industry. And when I thought about that too, I was like, well, the types of people who are getting funded by like venture capitalists and everything are just not people like me. And so I felt like I have a very unique edge to know like the technical experience, but also understand the problem as a consumer and go after this like untapped opportunity. So that's what got me interested in the beauty um, space, which is like a really random pivot from working at Google. But um, as you can see, it was just like the personal connection. And then I was very fortunate to meet my co-founders, um, Sylvan and Nicole, in our first semester at business school. So I was at Harvard for business school. Um, Nicole worked at L'Oreal for six years, so she had the beauty industry experience, which is what I was, you know, lacking. Um, and Sylvan also came from the tech background. She was at Airbnb. She worked at a streaming TV startup called Tubi. And the three of us came together and basically started Hue. Um, and now kind of where we are today, um, we are a like seed stage company. We're still really small. We're like four people <laughs> full time. So it's a very lean and mean um, team, but we've grown extremely quickly. Um, we raised over $2 million in financing um, from venture capital last year in our pre-seed round. 
Um, we have over 30 beauty brands that we're working with right now. And so we've been growing um, super fast. So thank you. It's been, it's been an amazing journey. It's really um, difficult, um, but it's also really rewarding. So um, yeah, happy to speak about kind of that journey. If, if any folks here are like thinking about taking that leap. I think that's so exciting. Good for you. That's what, what an amazing story. Well, so let's, let's dive in a little bit more. Um, Back up to maybe you're even taking on the APM role. Like what what background brought you to that? How did you decide to start there as a career path? Yeah, it's a great question. I kind of came from a bit of a non-traditional background to the APM program. So kind of historically, PMs at Google were very technical, like pretty much all engineers who were hired. Like if you studied computer science or engineering, you were hired into a product manager role at Google. Um, I actually majored in neuroscience in undergrad, so it was very like different, um, but I did, I was always like interested in technology, like even when I was in like high school, I was doing a lot of like web design kind of stuff. Um, and then in college, I also um, did a minor in computer science. So I kind of had somewhat of a technical background, but I was coming from a bit less like traditional. Um, and the way I got there was that I had actually... Um, talk to a lot of founders because I knew, again, I was interested in this entrepreneurial path. And a lot of them had told me that they started their career in one of these like product management rotational programs because they said, hey, it's a really great way to learn like leadership, learn kind of working with those cross-functional people. And like, that's a great way to build a kind of foundational um, skill set in your career that could be relevant when you go to start a company. So I was like, oh, well, maybe I didn't even know what a product manager was. I was like, okay, I guess I'll look into, you know, what that is. And then I just um, applied and um, it was funny because I actually applied for pro the APMM, the product marketing program and the APM program, but I totally like bombed my APMM <laughs> interview and they were like, I think you would be a better fit for product management than product marketing. Um, so that's kind of like how I ended up there. And um, luckily, like um, uh, Brian, who like runs the program, he like was one of the early product leaders at um, in Gmail. He kind of saw that, hey, I can bring a different perspective because I have this like psychology and decision making and neuroscience background that maybe not all of the you know PMs in the program had. Awesome. But it was honestly a career defining um, opportunity. I think, um, yeah, I feel very fortunate because there's so many, you know, great candidates who apply to that program and they only take like 45 or 50 people a year. So it is like, um, you know, up to chance at some point, but yeah. Amazing. And so, so now you're there for five years. It's obviously a great role. It's a wonderful place to work. And now you make the decision that you're going to leave. So talk us through your, your thinking there. How did you yeah. know? How did you decide? Yeah, it was something that I had thought about for a while. I guess when I was in undergrad, I also had kind of set myself up to potentially go to business school one day. Like I took the GMAT. Um, I like had like the test scores and the, the GMAT scores were like expiring. So this is really the last year that, that I could apply kind of. Um, but also I kind of felt like I got to a place within where I was at Google, where I had learned a lot and I, the growth curve was starting to like flatten out a little bit. It would be like, oh yeah, you know, every year we're doing OKRs and strategy and I'm doing more experiments, like doing more of the same thing. Um, and I could have like switched to maybe another team within Google and gotten like a really different experience, which I think is, is awesome. But I felt like that was the right point for me to just like take take a step back and be like, now is a good moment as, as well, personally, where like I was like approaching like 30 and, you know, if I want to start a company, especially as a woman, frankly, like I want to do it before I have, you know, I start to have a family and like start to have other obligations. So I was like, now's the time I need to just like take that leap. And um, business school felt like a really great balance because I could get a degree and really, um, do something productive while experimenting with starting my own business. And I figured if it doesn't succeed, at least I got an MBA and I will likely be able to get, you know, whatever job I want to get. Um, so it felt like a good balance of like, not just like quitting cold turkey and starting a company, but um, having something that I'm doing that's productive, even if it didn't work out. And you talk to us about how you met your co-founder. You met them in business school with you. How did you know these are the folks that I'm going to be going on this amazing journey with. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think what's great about grad school, if like anyone here is considering that, is that 
everyone is you go to grad school when you are career pivoting and you're thinking about like something new, like everybody's left their job. They're like open to new experiences. So it's not like you're trying to convince someone who's already in a really great paying job to like leave their job and come work with you on a company. Like everyone's already left their job and they're like ready to explore the next thing. So um, that was great. And then within school too. um, So we had a lot of programs around like startups and things to support students who wanted to start a company. So I actually met my co-founders because we all applied to do this startup bootcamp program that Harvard Business School was running. And so we had already shown an intention that we were interested in starting companies. So that made it like a lot easier to kind of find the people who had that similar goal in mind. Um, But it's also, um, I think it's important to, when considering like co-founders is also aligning on your values or like aligning on what your actual intentions and goals are. Because I think sometimes people just say, oh, I want to start a company, but it's more like they kind of just want to test that out and explore it. They're not really serious about it. And so we had a lot of conversations early on about like, is this something we like seriously want to do after we graduate? Like, are we willing to take that risk and, you know, know that we're not going to get paid as much as we could be making and, you know, going back to Google or being in a PM role or whatever else we could be doing? And what does success mean to us? Like, why are we fundamentally doing this? And I think the three of us were all women of color as well. And so we all really aligned on the mission. Like we all felt that pain point so strongly that we felt like there really needs to be a solution and we have the right backgrounds to solve it. So I think it's important when you're finding co-founders um, to align on like, what's your goal here? What does success look like to you? Is it like making a lot of money? Is it exiting the business? Is it um, solving like a real problem? Like what motivates you? Because that has allowed us to sit together. We actually just crossed like three years of working together, um, which is crazy, but um, that's what's kind of like kept us um, tight, I think. So when you talk about it, it it all sounds like it came together just as planned. Were there any moments where you had doubts, where you had questions? Is this really the path? Are these really the people? I mean, where were the, where were the moments and, and how did you get through those? Oh yeah, um, there's a, there's a lot of you know times, but I do think the um, one benefit of having like great co-founders is that you can kind of pick each other up when you might be down. Um, we had to go through a lot of pivots. So when we first started, like our business idea was actually related to sampling. Like we were like, oh well, if you could like sample multiple shades from home, that would be like a really great you know thing, and that would like help people to find their match. Of course. And so we actually like built a whole product around that where we were, we like went to Sephora and like bought the products and then like pumped them out into like little sample kits and we were selling those online. So it was really like scrappy and like not glamorous. Um, But quickly we realized that like that wasn't going to be scalable and it wasn't really going to work, but we had to like pivot the business a number of times. And even now we're, we're now like focused primarily on this like video shopping experience and expanding that beyond even just beauty. So um, like helping you see real people like you, whether you're shopping for like a dress or for, you know, a bag or for, you know, any beauty products. So we've had to really like navigate all of those like twists and turns. Um, But I, I really do think it like comes back to what I was saying before, which is like, what are your goals with starting a company? What does success look like for you? Having that alignment within our team that it's about this mission. It's about like making an impact. Like we want to make a sustainable business. Like, so every decision that we make is going to come back to that, even when it is, you know, difficult. Um, and yeah, I think raising funding is is difficult. It's like, especially difficult in the current environment. And so, um, yeah, you have to like stay true to whatever those like roots are, because sometimes it might not like work out the exact way that you think um, it's going to. Well, so you read my mind on my next question. I wanted to ask you about your fundraising journey. How did you get started? How did you know what to do, who to contact? How would you go Yeah, about- I think, yeah, on that, we were pretty fortunate, again, by being in this um, business school environment because we started, we raised our first round of funding while we were still in school, um, which is kind of like an interesting experience too, but we were probably six months out from, from graduating. Um, and luckily- we were able to meet a lot of people through that network. Um, And even professors, like I had one professor who he's an investor as well. And so he literally like shepherded me through this process of like, hey, here's the feedback on the pitch. Like, this is what's going to land with an investor. This is what they're not going to get. 
and especially working on a business in a space that's so like beauty is so female dominated, like trying to pitch that to um, a typical like male investor, there's a disconnect that you need to like get over and like figure out how to communicate with them and help them empathize with the problem. So um, getting a lot of like feedback from people who have been in on the investor's shoes and in the VC side. And I even had classmates who had been investors before. So I was able to like trial run the pitch with them, which was super helpful. Um, and then they were also able to introduce us to other people. So through like the alumni network, we were able to get in front of a lot of investors. Um, and so I, I cannot um, overemphasize like the value if you are trying to start a company. I feel like there's this um, narrative within Silicon Valley that like, oh, MBAs are like not valuable, like tech people don't need those. And I'm like, well, actually you you kind of do, or like it can be really, really helpful because it can help you just like have a system of support because everybody wants to help students um, and especially alumni, like they really want to help. So I know that's not like applicable to everyone. The other kind of place where I got a lot of support from a fundraising perspective was actually my former like coworkers at Google. So my old boss, he, when I left, he was like, and he was super supportive of me um, going and like starting a business. He's like, yeah, you should definitely like do that. And when I left, he like, he basically said, call me when you're raising, I want to be the first check into your company. Um, and he did. I like called him. I was like, Hey, we're raising now. He's like, okay, great. I'm like, I'm investing, you know, $25,000. And that was such a big deal at that time to have that like initial capital and support from people who know you. So, um, once we started like raising the bigger round, we actually opened up like a friends and family round for, you know, all of our like former coworkers or people in our network. And luckily, you know, Googlers do make a good amount of money. So um, there were a number of people like old engineers from my team or designers who um, came in as angel investors, which was really, um, really awesome. I mean, that's, that to me just showed like the power of the like network and community that I had built, like people who I had worked with for five years were really like behind me. And so um, I'm sure like if y'all are thinking about going off and like starting something, just don't underestimate the support that you might get from people that you worked with um, previously. I hope you're all hearing this plug for the Zoogler network. <laughs> I that we are part of this incredibly powerful network. And the whole point of these sessions is to encourage people to make use of that network. Um, so that's an amazing story. So uh, other folks who would be founders, what would be your advice? What's the, what was the most fun? What was the least fun? You know, what would you say to them if people are thinking about starting a company? Yeah. Um, I mean, my advice is always just to go for it. Um, I think, um, I know we talked about this before too, Catherine, like, um, I think if you've been a Googler, like you're already in essentially like an upper echelon of people, like you, the downside of like taking the risk and taking that leap is not as great as it would be for others, right? Like you already have Google on your resume. You will likely be able to get like another job and another like really great job. So don't take that for granted, right? And like that name goes so far and it also help you when you're going out into your like raising journey and, um, and it's, it's a certain stamp, right, of approval on your resume. So I think just, I know it's hard because it's hard to like step away from maybe like a certain lifestyle that you had because you like were making a good um, salary and all that kind of stuff. But if it's in your soul to like pursue something, I think for me, it was just like, I don't want to regret not having tried, um, knowing that I can always like come back to um, the like PM career path. Um I will say it is definitely not for everyone. Like it's really, really hard. And I think the founder life and everything gets really glamorized from the outside because you only see like the tech crunch articles about someone raising like $10 million in funding or, you know, people's LinkedIn posts about all their successes. Like we're guilty of that as well. Like that's exactly the external, you know, persona that you're going to put out there. But the day to day is like really, really difficult because unlike like at Google, I never felt like, okay, if my project doesn't go well, like the whole company is going to go down. <laughs> That's just not going to happen. Right. Um, whereas here, like, you know, your actions, like every single day, um, that, that impacts the like future of your company. Like your company is default dead for most of the time until you like figure out how to make it profitable and how to find like product market fit. So that's, that's hard. And you don't have the resources at your disposal either. Like 
that was another thing that I took for granted in a way at Google is like, you're surrounded by people who are the best of the best at what they do. You have like the best lawyer, you have the best, you know, designer, you're the best like marketer. That's like so valuable, the people. And when you're starting your own company, you have to figure out how to like recruit those people or like how to make do with, you know, people who might not be like as good at everything because you only have like a limited budget um, to spend. So um, that is definitely something I, I miss about that experience and the free food. That was, that was great too. But, um, I think just like the people that are, that are around you. Um, yeah. Um, and then the other thing I think that's helpful to know is even though I thought, okay, I'm, I'm getting this PM experience and that's going to help me like be a founder actually in reality, like what I learned as a PM is probably 10% of my actual job now. Um, like product, I run the product and engineering side, but it's like one little sliver. Like I also have to figure out fundraising. I also have to figure out like our accounting, our legal stuff, our HR stuff, our, you know, business development. Like how do we go to market? Like there's, there's a million other things that I had to like learn and figure out that you wouldn't even have visibility into at an organization like Google, because so much of that is just like built into the infrastructure of the company that you don't even have to think about. So um, a lot of like new skills to learn, but that's what makes it like fun as well. Yeah. It's a great point. I was going to ask you about the the leap to sort of expanding your role to cover all things. How did you, how do you go about that? Did the MBA help with that? Or is it learning on the role? Is it, you know, tapping friends with that experience? How are you, how are you navigating that? Yeah. Yeah. The MBA helped a lot. Um, just like fundamentals in terms of like, like finance, for example, was something that I wasn't really comfortable in, or I hadn't had a lot of experience in and just getting to like run some reps of doing the case studies and doing some financial models and, you know, feeling really comfortable with that, that, that was really helpful. Um, I think also like my co-founders coming from really different backgrounds, like, um, Nicole was a marketer at L'Oreal and like, she had a PNL that she had to manage. And so she's like very accustomed to like creating a budget and like um, creating financial projections because that was a big part of her job. So we were each able to kind of like bring what we had learned from our previous organizations, which was super helpful because from the product side, like they didn't know anything about like how to manage an engineering team, how to run user testing. Like there were certain things that how to do an A-B test. Like I, I had done that so many times that I was able to like take that and basically adapt it into what we were um, doing within the startup. I think one thing that you have to be careful of though, is that like Google has a lot of process. And so I think there can be a tendency to, if you want to like do it the same way that you're familiar with, you might like over engineer and over process things, which I think that's what was helpful from um, my third co-founder Sylvan, since she came from like the startup environment, like there's no OKRs, there's no like perf, like that's just like not even a thing. <laughs> like, we don't need that right now. That just like process is going to slow us down when we're just like a three person company. So striking the right balance of like what to bring in from your Google experience and what to let go of from the Google experience, I think is pretty important. A lot of people willing to drop the OKRs. <laughs> that might yeah. be <laughs> <laughs> finally make the leap. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I, you know, it sounds like the dream world. Tell us, tell us a little bit more about the hard times. What are, you know, what, what are the scary moments? What are the things that you, you know, it, 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 the advice you prepare people for the emergencies or the crises that you had to get through? Yeah. Um, there's so many, <laughs> it's like all the time. I think, yeah, that's the crazy thing about startup land is it's like very up and down and like the highs are really high, but the lows can be like really low. Um, I mean, it ranges from like, you know, times when like our product went down on our customer's website and now we're like having to scramble to try to like solve that problem and like figure out what's going on and like troubleshoot. And, you know, when that happens and you only have like five customers, like it's a really big deal because, you know, again, that could like totally tank your entire business um, to like, again, like hiring, hiring is really hard. Find the right talent to bring your, on your team is really hard. We've had experiences where we've like hired people and they just didn't work out. And so at Google, you're, I'm like, I never had to fire someone. Right. Um, that was not something that I, and, and then when you do, you're like, um, I don't even know how to do that. Right. It's like HR. If you had to do that, HR probably would have like handled it for you. So this is kind of the type of thing where it's like the buck stops with you when you're a founder, because you are the person, you are the HR, you are the finance, you are the 
the whatever SRE like person, you're the person they're going to customer is going to call. So just have to be ready to like take in all of that and like kind of roll with the punches because what I have learned though is like even in the moment those things feel like they're awful and they're so terrible but like two months later like it was nothing it was just like a blip on the radar and you figured it out and you like and you got past it so I think that's made it easier now as we face new challenges we're just like well if how, how are we going to feel about this in like 10 days in like 10 months it's probably just going to be like another thing that we figured out so um, the nice thing about doing startups is I think it builds your confidence because you realize that all these challenges, like you can, you can figure it out. It may be very painful in the short term, but, um, you'll figure it out as you go on. Um, fundraising, I think is like extremely difficult mentally because it is like a bit of a numbers game and getting out there and you get a lot of no's and you just have to be prepared to hear no a lot. Um, like you'll get like 90% no's and then maybe like 10% yeses. So um, that's just something that I think a lot of founders go through that they don't realize like how difficult it really is um, because you do see just like all the success stories out there. So that's another thing I would advise folks, especially um, if you're going out to like raise money, just know that it's normal. <laughs> it's very normal. Um, even the best companies have got a lot of rejection um, before they got to people who really had the conviction. Um, yeah. And then I guess my last thing would be any opportunity you have to build um, friendships with other founders, like that's what I found to be really helpful is getting to know founders who are a couple steps ahead of me. So people who have raised like a series A or are just like one step ahead. I, I literally had a call this morning with one of the other founders in my, um, that's in the same portfolio of the VC that backed us in the pre-seed. And um, yeah, he's like a couple steps ahead. And so anytime we have like a challenge that we're going through, which is helpful to be able to get on the phone, call someone who really like gets what you're going through and will be very candid with you about um, what what they did in the past to like solve that challenge. Awesome. How do you think about building your team? I heard you say, you know, the hiring is the hardest part. Do you use a lot of like outsourced resources or how, or how are you thinking about growing? Yeah, yeah, we, um, so yes, we, we use a lot of, um, contractors in general, because that's like a really flexible way to um, operate the business where you can like flex up and down with contractors super easily versus, you know, hiring someone full time and in house. Um, so for example, we have like interns um, who are helping us with like, um, just like tactical, like operational stuff for like sales and like business development stuff, like researching prospects and things like that. Um, we're also working with some outsourced engineers. So I like hired a team based in Ukraine, um, on the engineering side. And that has been like a really lower cost way for us to do development for like our early MVP. And then we're, we're hiring now like the in-house team as well. Um, but I think you have to get like really creative. Like I didn't have much experience working with, um, contractors or outsourced teams when I was at Google, but, um, you know, learning that there are a lot of a lot of resources like available to you that can be either like fractional resources, outsourced resources. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about like optimizing from a cost standpoint and figuring out like, where do you really need to invest from a full-time um, standpoint? And it's good to like test it out with a um, part-time or outsourced resource to see like how productive are is that? And is that the thing that's moving the needle in your business before you decide to invest in hiring someone like kind of full, fully on? But I think that's been a very, that's a very common thing, especially right now, now that like a lot of companies are remote first anyway, it makes it even easier to um, bring on, you know, folks from different, um, di different kinds of resources, whether it's full-time or outsourced. Yeah. So I take it you're remote first, are you? Um, yeah, right now we are. I think it's like to be determined where that goes. Right now our team is kind of distributed around the U.S. and then you have this Ukrainian team as well, so um yeah we're kind of everywhere awesome um yeah. the topic we want to do a full topic on that as a back in the office versus outsource so i i was wondering where you're coming out on that mm. um, yeah we actually um i'm actually in person this week in sf with um my team and basically the balance that we've been able to strike is that um we just come together in person more often so we even though we're not all living in the same place or the same city we make it a point to make time like once a quarter spend like at least a week together um because I think it is really important especially at the early days 
Um, and we were in person right when we were in school. So I guess the first like year and a half of building the business, we were all together. And I think that's probably pretty important for a co-founding team. Like I can't really imagine like completely starting from scratch and being remote. That would be a little bit challenging. Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking these days that there's a lot of these outsourced resources as we're talking about that to, to sort of build business in a, in a box, like a Lego almost for compliance, for payroll, for even shipping, all these kinds of things. Are, are you are you tapping those and finding that they're helpful to allow you to scale without having to insource everything? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, like, like, sorry, let me just speak over you. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, there's like you know, um, there's great tools that like, especially the things that are not mission critical. Like they're not going to make or break your differentiation as a business. Like use gusto right for hr like it's it already like does all your payroll and everything like it's a great it's a low cost like good resource like don't reinvent the wheel (laughs) um i think what's interesting is like if you spent your whole career at google like i did um because google doesn't use any third party um tools or resources you kind of have to learn like we weren't even using slack right (laughs) so like the first time i used slack was when i like left google and was in business school so um but you'll quickly figure out like what it is that people are are using um, and just like talking to other founders about what their stack looks like and what what um, tools they found to be like most helpful. Um, yeah, that's that's really important. Yeah. I actually found changing technology the hardest part of leaving Google to <laughs> learning Slack and learning all these teams and everything. I, I actually maybe that's one of the things I miss most. <laughs> if you, if you, do you, do you use Google tools? I'm curious at your company. Do you, do you prefer drive? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we do. We use drive, but we use zoom um, for video conferencing. Um, and, but yeah, we use like drive and Gmail and stuff like that. So, yeah. Well, so advice, I mean, there's a lot of folks on this call that, you know, are fascinated by your path and advice you have for them. Like, on anything, career choices, goals, anything. Yeah, I am. I'm, I don't know if we're going to do like a Q&A, but I'm curious, like what is top of mind for folks? Because um, I know everyone's probably at like a bit of a different stage of where they are in their path and whether they want to do entrepreneurship or not. Um, but yeah, I think if you're looking to start a company, I, I really think it starts with like the people. So figuring out who you're going to work on this business with. Um, it's literally like a marriage. Like you are spending, I spend more time with my co-founders than I do with my husband. So like literally you're spending a day in and day out with these people. Like, are these the people that you want to work with? Do you again align on values? Are are you um, excited to like go down that path together? And um, I know some people try to do it on their own. I know I personally would find that really difficult for some of the reasons I talked about, like managing the ups and downs emotionally, staying motivated and like productive. Um, So I would focus on like finding the people you want to work with, because that's going to be kind of the foundation within your, within your company. Um, Yeah. So, but hopefully I think there's a lot of people out there who are looking to make that leap. So, and probably the Zoogler network is great for that. Um, So I think there's ways to like get connected, but that would be my like number one, like piece of advice and stuff is like, figure that out um, as you get started. Awesome. And, and uh, you know, people is the reason that a lot of people stay at Google. It's it's not just to be a founder. It's like you want to work with people that you like working with, right? Whether it's at exactly. a... Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, folks, it, this is your time. Does anybody have questions? Um, this is a chance to pose them. I'll uh, open it up to the floor. I have I have lots. I can keep going. But if, if anyone wants to... I, ask, I have questions. If you Go ahead. Maybe introduce yourself, I, Anna, if you don't mind. Hi, I'm Anna in London. Um, I was at Google and Google Maps and people operations. Um, so I've got two questions. Pick one. So one is um, like, what does success look like? Like you mentioned it. You said you had shared values. So I'm just curious. And the second question is, because I'm too much of a scaredy cat to start my own company, definitely not on my own. Like, is it possible to be an entrepreneur in someone else's company you know they always say at google act like an owner like is that just a myth is that nonsense if you just got to do it to really do it or not so pick your question or both yeah those are great great questions um i i to answer your second 
question. Like, yes, like, of course, there's like entrepreneurialism. And like, uh, you know, I've thought about, you know, if I wasn't doing my own company, what would I what would be my like next best thing that I would love to be doing? And I think it would be something like um, joining an organization and maybe spinning up like a new line of business or like a new product line where you're basically like starting something from scratch as well, but sort of inside the bigger organization. So I think you can definitely get some of that um, excitement of like, hey, we're creating something from scratch. We're having to figure out a lot of stuff. I, I don't think there's something equivalent to literally being on your own and starting a company from scratch. Because again, like I said, there's so much that you need to figure out, like the resourcing of it, the, you know, how do you like keep it alive? <laughs> it's like, how do you keep this baby alive? Essentially is like a different type of feeling. But um, I do think there's there's a way to achieve that without taking that like heavy like level of risk. Um, and then on your first question on on success, yeah, it's something we think about all the time. And for me, it's like a couple of things. Um, one, it's like really goes back to like solving a problem in the world that you see as a gap and really creating an impact through the business. Like, what are we what are we solving for the end consumer? Like when I hear people say, oh my God, like I saw your tool on this website and it was so helpful to me and it like helped me you know, make my purchase or like this, like impacted me in some way, like it helped me feel represented. Like that's what really drives me personally is like having that impact. Maybe that comes from my like time at Google where I saw like the impact, like when I would talk to people who use Google photos and they would be like, oh my God, that's my favorite product at Google. And like, here's how I use it. Like that just is really personally um, satisfying uh, to me. Um, So I feel like if, if we get away from that, like, oh, we're just like chasing the biggest like dollar opportunity or something, but we're like totally not building something that I feel is like impactful, then that is something that like wouldn't motivate me as much. Um, But I truly believe that like you create like business value as well through like creating, making a difference in whatever space you're in. Um, And then I think the second area for me is um, kind of showing other people that they can also take this path. Because like I said, there just aren't a lot of people like us, like my co-founder, one of my co-founders is black. The other is like Chinese American. We're all like women of color. There's not like a three women of color, like founded company that has like become a unicorn. Like, I don't think that even exists today. So I think that just like personally drives us of like, Hey, can we be that? Can we like show other people that it's possible, you know, later on my dream would be to like go and like advise other um, founders on their businesses. So um, that's kind of like the longer term, like personal uh, motivation too. Um, and Pauline, I saw you link the Boardroom Beauty podcast. Actually, my co-founder, Nicole, was on that podcast, I think a couple months ago. So if you guys want to learn more about her background, um, I think she, she was on there recently. Awesome. I'm going to go listen. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So what's what's in the near term plan for you guys? What's what's up? What's on deck? Yeah, um, we are super busy. <laughs> um, we have, <laughs> as I mentioned, a lot of customers now, um, and so really our our priority is kind of just like growth and growing on the on the revenue side. So um, we have ambitious goals for next year. I would say um, we already have thirty brands on now. We're trying to get to like sixty more I- incremental brands on the platform next year. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of, um, growth to go there. And, um, we've been like hiring people. So I hired a customer success manager who's like working directly with our customers and that's been going really well. Um, so just like figuring out how we kind of continue, continue accelerating with the growth that we've already seen. There's a question in the chat about explaining user generated content, a little bit more about the business, tell, mm. tell the product and, and the product vision. Yeah, for sure. So, um, basically user generated content. It is like when everyday customers kind of talk about products and like recommend products to other people. So for example, um, if you are on TikTok or on YouTube and you've seen like people talking about products, like that's like user generated content because it's really coming from the end consumer. Um, what's interesting is like UGC has sort of been, um, changed as a term over the years. Like there's a lot of influencer marketing content that's also construed as UGC, I think what we're what we're trying to tap into is like the true authentic everyday consumer and not like the influencers because we find that people don't really like trust these like sponsored influencers anymore. They really want to see like someone who's authentic, who 
you know, they might not have perfect skin. They may not have like, you know, the perfect like body, but they are like giving their real um, opinions about things because that's what like a real consumer can, can relate to. Um, and essentially what we're like focusing on right now is helping brands to actually create and like tap into those communities, because as you can imagine, it's not easy for a brand to find like thousands of everyday people who are willing to like create video reviews and share their experience. So we kind of, we have a network of people and we basically facilitate that connection between the brand and the consumer. And then we help them to integrate that content onto the shopping experience or the tech kind of piece as well. So yeah, it's a little bit about it. Awesome. Um, so from Crystal in the chat, how would you recommend proving product market fit? So you talk a little bit about your exploratory journey and how you actually had to pivot. Um, but but mm. how do you decide on that this is it, we've got the fit we were looking for? Yeah. Um, I think many, many companies take years to find product market fit. So I think even just to like level set on that, like, because it kind of you're probably not going to find product market fit before you have to take the leap of faith. <laughs> that's just, that's just what it is. So um, that's why I said like focusing on the people and almost like the general space and maybe category that you're interested in and feeling um, because I was, I started with a space that I personally was a consumer of. I had a lot of conviction that, Hey, there is a gap here and there is like a true need and problem here because I've been like a I've felt that pain point. So I think a lot of great businesses sort of start by either like a problem that the founder faced in their career, like in their work experience from like a B2B perspective, or like a problem that you face as a consumer, and then sort of pulling on that thread and figuring out like what you're going to have to pivot through a lot of different solutions, probably. And then as you're going on, you're also getting feedback from the market. So essentially our approach, and I think this is um, what I would recommend is starting with like small experiments. So basically like our first experiment was like running the sampling um, thing. And we probably did that for like two to four weeks. Like it wasn't very long at all. And within that period of time, we proved like, hey, people are willing to pay for these samples. So that shows that there's like a high you know, need and like pain point. But also like we did a lot of research on like the logistics and we did a lot of thought onto like the operational model. And we're like, hey, that's going to be like really difficult to scale. So within a very short period of time, you can time box it and be like, I'm running this experiment for this period of time. I'm going to do my like very simple, like MVP, see what I can prove out and then sort of um, go from there and basically pull on the thread of like what's working. So when we did like our, the reason why we got into the UGC thing was because we were like, Hey, there's this like interesting idea of like, what if you could shade match by finding people who look like you um, and people were already kind of doing that on social media. So we're like, let's test that out. That turned out to like work really well. It was like driving conversion. It was driving sales. And then we're like, okay, we're going to double down on that and kind of like keep going in that direction. So yeah, small experiments, I think help a lot, but you kind of have to accept that you're going to have to take a leap of faith before you know if you have product market fit. I think most companies only have product market fit at like the series A, which is probably like a couple of years into their you know business. So yeah. So from Deja, um, based on you, you have excellent experience, you've, you know, five years of Google product managing MBA from Harvard. Um, how do you kind of continue learning and invest in mm. maintaining your skill set? I mean, you've also got to broaden into a CEO role. And then how do you encourage your team to do the same? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think the biggest thing for me and for our team, I think, has been advisors. So we really like recognize that there were certain areas that our team did not have expertise in. For example, we all came from consumer building consumer products and we were embarking on a journey to build a B2B SaaS and we had zero sales experience among the three of us. And that's like absolutely critical for a um, SaaS business. So what we did on that front was we like found a lot of like advisors and coaches who were experts in sales and, um, we basically like engage them. Like we got introductions through like our network or through our investors. And we said, Hey, we, we like met like a ton of people. I think on the sales side, we probably met like 20 people who were different levels of like sales experience and expertise. Um, and ideally, you know, folks in our similar industry. And then we ended up bringing on like one or two of them as like formal advisors. And they were able to help us like, Hey, this is how you run a sales process. This is how you run a discovery call let's do like a mock, you know, call and like give you feedback. 
whenever we have like a difficult deal, like let's call them up and see what they think we should do. And so I think that's a really productive way to um, get like fill in the gaps that you know that you have is to find like people who are experts and you'd be surprised there's a million people out there and um, they are often like very willing to help and um, they can be just great resources and not at necessarily a high cost either. Like we have give a little bit of equity to an advisor and um, that can be really um, effective. So. And you, you mentioned that there is this bias against founders, MBAs against founders that are not technical, not that don't kind of fit the Silicon Valley mold of a founder. Terry asks if you have any advice for sort of non fit the mold founders, whether they're later in their career or whether they don't have a technical background or kind of advice for sort of overcoming that uh, Silicon Valley style bias. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it really depends on like what kind of business you're building. Like if you're like, I'm going to build an AI company, well, <laughs> you should probably <laughs> have someone who's like technical on that team or else it's going to be a little bit challenging. Um, but if your business is more of like a business model innovation and less of like a technical innovation, then I think it, it can totally work. Um, I will say like, I mean, I do have like a technical background. It's something that I had to, and still have to remind myself is that like, I am technical, like just because you were a product manager doesn't mean you're not technical. Like I've worked with engineers my whole career. Like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> and I think sometimes, you know, got to tell the investors, like, look, um, I know how to like manage these teams. Like I have that experience and, you know, not undersell that. Cause I think that's maybe something that women kind of tend to do more than others is like undersell their backgrounds and like not be confident in the experience that you do have. So um, I guess, Harry, like if you worked with engineers or like, even if you weren't like a product manager or an engineer, like you probably have a good amount of experience that you can still lean into. And like you worked at Google, like there's a lot you can say if it's just a matter of like convincing an investor. Um, but I will say, yeah, I, I do think it's important to, if you if you are building a technical product to find like folks early on who can be um, co-founders or like founding team members that have that background. Um, frankly, like I think we, it would have benefited us. Like if we did have a person in our founding team who was an engineer, like that would have been helpful. So I think if you can figure that out, that's great. It's, it's not like a um, requirement though, I think to getting started, because I think a lot of times with engineers as well, if you can show that like, Hey, I bring this like business expertise, I bring you know, the industry expertise to what I'm building and I've already maybe already like lined up some customers or I already have like an M MVP like concept, they might get even more excited about that because they're like, oh, this person actually knows <laughs> what they're doing on the business side. And, you know, I want to get behind and like partner with someone who can like bring that to the table and they already have some traction because there's so many different opportunities that an engineer could go after. And so if they feel like there's already motion there, they might get more, more excited. Yeah. No, that's not a great answer, but um, I think I think uh, I'm not going to say that you can or should do it without a technical founder if it's a technical uh, product. Yeah. Well, I think your advice about finding the right founders too. I mean, actually, I've I've read investors that say you know solo founded companies are, that they won't invest in them because there's just too much to do to be a solo founder, and so you're really looking for yeah. like a dual or tri tripod to kind of touch every base out there. Because nobody's an expert. Yeah. In um, exactly. And I think um, just on folks who are like trying to find co-founders, I think getting into the rooms, like putting it out there that you're thinking about starting a company in a certain certain space, um, you'll be so surprised how much resources like come back to you. Like I start, as soon as I started telling people, hey, I'm like kind of starting a company in like this like beauty and tech space. The number of people who came back to me were like, oh, I know this other person who's like kind of interested in that or like, oh, I have a friend who like, you know, might be really like intrigued in that. Like then those resources started coming back to me. So just encourage people to like let people know it's kind of scary, but like let people know that you have this intention and you, that will help you find the right people a lot faster. So Anna asked about the downsides of uh, being close to your founders. I mean, I, certainly there are famous stories of co-founder disputes. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, you were fortunate in finding founders that that you can work so well with, um, but kind of any sort of managing risk tips there? For... 
Yeah. I mean, obviously get, get your, I think people will advise you, like, just get the legal, you know, documentation all there. Like you never know what can happen. It's like a prenup, like make sure that you have everything like set up correctly in terms of like the founder agreements and the founder shares and, you know, what happens if somebody like leaves the business. Something that we did um, between the three of us was since we were in school, you know, we didn't know if like someone might decide that, hey, I actually want to like go recruit for a job and, you know, not do this anymore. So we actually set up our vesting schedule for our founder shares so that none of our shares actually vested until we graduated. So if somebody had decided to like go and take another job and like leave, like they wouldn't, by default, they wouldn't get anything in the business and we could have that equity kind of like opened up. And then that also creates like the right incentives and like motivation, like, hey, I still want to keep going with this because I want to, you know, realize that value. And I think the typical like vesting structure for founder shares is like, a four-year vesting schedule with like a one-year cliff. So just like set up the right, there's a lot of like advice out there on like the standard practice, but like set up the right structures from the beginning. Um, And then I think maybe the difference for us is like, we actually weren't like friends before we started the business. Like we met each other in the context of like starting this company together. So it's very much like, you know, your coworkers where, you become friends through going through this experience together. Um, I can't really advise on like people who are thinking about starting a business with a friend, because I think that can also be a little bit tricky where you have like a personal relationship and like that, you know, if the business like goes south, like are there other like impacts or I've had friends who started businesses with like their partner or their spouse. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's really intense. I don't think I would do that because again, if like something, you know, then you have personal conflict and everything like coming into it. However, there have been many founders who've been super successful in that. So I just don't think it's like a one size um, fits all um, situation. But I think you have to like the people that you work with. You're going to be like miserable if you don't like the people that you work with. So um, I'm sure everyone's had that experience with their coworkers and the people that they think fondly of and, you know, remember like the great work experiences that you had versus, versus not. Yeah. Right. So any final questions for Jean V? Anybody want the last question? Otherwise I will take it and ask you to give this group your final best words of advice based on your experiences. Oh man, um, I think I shared a lot already. Also, thanks for the great questions. This is like super fun and um, I'm happy to be like helpful and be a resource for anyone. So like just reach out on like LinkedIn or um, yeah, Catherine, feel free to like, share my info um what are my favorite products oh, I have like beauty products oh my gosh I have so many um <laughs> we're working with a brand called um um Tatcha and like they're they're really great um I love their products um skincare stuff definitely recommend shopping the Black Friday sales <laughs> for everything because that's the cheapest that you're gonna get everything um but yeah um yeah just like ask people d- don't be afraid to like ask people for help that's why I'm saying like I'm happy to chat with people because um that's like kind of how I learned everything was just like being willing to just reach out to people and tell them hey I'm working on this thing are you willing to chat even if they say no like what's the downside so uh, yeah that's great advice ask for help I don't think we do that often enough um and shop the Black Friday sales (laughs) (laughs) all right uh so listen Jean V thank you so much for joining us for your generosity with your time and for being so frank with your you know your your answers to all the questions and everyone for participating this is our last session for the year I thank you all for coming I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season enjoy the sales and we will see you in the new year Well, thank you guys. Great to meet you all. Good luck with everything. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.